welcome to the Publishing by the Numbers podcast. It is, well, when, when you're listening to this anyway, it will be the 22nd of January-ish. This is podcast number 14. We're talking about plotting, pantsing, and mapping. The great debate continues. I'm Jana S. Brown, and I'm joined today by my two amazing co-hosts, Virginia Anderson. Hi, Virginia. Hello. And CJ Anaya. Hey, guys. And hopefully by this point, you know who we all are. If not, go back to the first podcast and listen to all of them, because that way you'll get a feeling for who we are and what we do. And if you have any questions, put them in the comments. We're happy to answer them. So January, as our month that we're kicking off a new year and all that kind of thing, we've been digging into this whole idea of plotting. Now, we will acknowledge that one month, four episodes in the month, is not nearly enough to cover all the things that you can do with plotting, because plotting's big, man. But we thought this was a good place to start, so we will be coming back. Like um, Ali mentioned last week, we need to kind of dig into what are some of those beats within Save the Cat, and there are other methods that we could still bring in all sorts of cool guests for to get into some other methods, but we wanted to kind of leave this month on approaching and engaging with the grand debate of plotting, pantsing, mapping, you know, all these different things that we call it, and how this connects to outlines and some of what we do to keep track of how we create our outlines, create our research. So that's today's episode. So to begin with, uh, CJ, what is plotting versus pantsing versus mapping, and which one do you lean towards? I think we may have talked about this before, but now it's official. You're you're going to be recorded. Yes, we did. So plotting is the process of actually figuring out all of the the plotting points and the beats and the, the structure of your story before actually writing it. Okay. So, uh, and, and that can look different for a lot of different people. Some people are very detailed in the way that they plot something. Um, they'll have those, those character bios and they'll have, um, all of that, like a glossary, they'll do the world building. They'll have all of these sheets and things, all of this information, all of this backstory. Um, <laughs> yeah, Virginie's waving. She's like me, me yeah, also. We, we, we'll get to you in a minute. Just <laughs> keep going. And um, others will just attack the necessary points and then write from point A to point B to point C. And that's really the only blueprint that they need. Um, But there is some level of planning involved when it comes to plotting a story. Now, pantsers, which is something that I used to be, and to some extent I still am when I when I just feel the need to go off and not have really anything set in stone, is that you're you're flying by the seat of your pants when you're writing. Hence the name Pantsers. Uh, so you are quite literally just sitting down and you are free flowing and taking it where you want it to go. Some writers are very talented when it comes to free flowing and yet still maintaining a great structure. It's almost like they can, and Stephen King's a great example of this, and also someone who really hates the idea of plotting and will also tell you that you're not really an author if you do plot. Um <laughs> <laughs> yes, because but that's why his so endings nice. are iffy. Yes, that's that's true. Hard argument, uh, you know, arguably. <laughs> yeah. So there are, you know, so there can, there's always going to be a hit and a miss when it comes to freestyle. If at some point you do not go back to that story and at least have a developmental editor look at it just to see how that plot and structure is actually going, or if you don't actually plug your story back into some kind of plot structure just to see if you got everything you needed. Um, and and most often people think, okay, it's not constricting. I was able to get all my ideas out. But the thing that that is very frustrating for pantsers is that many times they don't know where they're going. They will hit a wall with that, or they they you know write themselves into a corner, and then they've got to backtrack. Um, what happens a lot for um, outliners is sometimes because you plotted it so well, you've you've um, you kind of lock yourself into an idea. And therefore, when the creative juices flow, you're you might be a little resistant to diverting or going away from the plot that you had just a little bit. So I think that there's some give and take there. Now, when it comes to mapping that, well, when you said mapping my, I, the first thing I thought of was a mind map. I don't know if that's what you're talking about specifically, but for me, mind mapping is really fun because what I do is I draw a big fat circle on construction paper 
and then I stick it to my wall because I'm super old school. Other people are much more fancy and can do this with technology, but I will quite literally say, here's the title of my story. And then I'll put a circle around it and then I'll go conflict. And then I'll put the circle around the conflict and I'll just like mind map stuff and then begin to draw lines where there's some ideas of events that, that could occur. So from the conflict and the goal that we're trying to achieve, I'm drawing like three little lines out of that big circle. And I'm going, here's one obstacle that could occur. Here's another obstacle that could occur. That could be one too. And so I'm throwing all of it on the paper with this kind of snowball mind mapping thing. And from there, once I see all of those ideas, then I could go, okay, now let's, let's organize this into something linear, you know, possibly chronological. How could I fit all of these ideas and all of these things into a plot? And I think that mind mapping is kind of the best of both worlds in the sense that you're still freestyling. You're throwing all of the ideas out there in a way where you can then pick and choose because you've labeled those ideas and you can put them in an order that you might find really helpful as far as plotting goes. Um, but those are kind of the three major ways in which people operate, although there are more. There are there's always going to be a different way for someone to write a book. Um, and the way that your brain works is going to be different than the way my brain works. But but the the eternal debate usually is this is better. No, that's better. And what I think is whatever works for you is better. So, you know, that's, it is up to you. So I don't have any hard or fast rule on you have to plot or you have to pants or you have to mind map. I just think whatever allows you to write a story that makes sense and is engaging and fabulous and that you would be proud to publish and sell. That's the way you, you, you know, write your story. So did I, did I get another gold star? I'm always shooting for gold yes, stars. You totally no. get a gold star, Excellent. but you forgot to tell us about how you do it. Oh, you, where, where, yes. where, where do you lie? Not that you have to be locked into this, because that's the other thing is that very often our styles and our process change for right. different stories, for different places in our career. So mm -hmm. so you don't have to be locked into it forever. But for right now, what what is your favorite method? Well, whenever I come up with a story, I I always have. And usually it's because of dreams. And so I usually have, this is why I don't sleep people. Uh, I usually have a notebook by my bed with a pencil because I will be half awake, half asleep, not lucid in any way, shape or form, writing crazy ideas down. And then I'll wake up in the morning and I'll look at it and I'll go, where the, did that come from? And then I'll review it and I'll think, okay. And what I found is that my brain, when it's half asleep, works in beginnings to inciting incident and then endings. And then the rest is just all, okay, we gave you enough, now go for it. And so what I find is that it's easier for me to hit certain plot points. And then as I go, I can fill in more of the details later. I'm not horribly, terribly detailed. I have to do the, the chapter brainstorming slash throw it all at the wall. And then when I can see it on paper and I can see all of these different ideas within this premise that I've come up with, that's where I can figure out the framework. Um, and it's always subject to change. So I would say that I plan in pants a little bit, both. I, I really do. But the more that I move along, the more I understand the structure, the easier it is for me to freestyle within that structure, I guess you could say. And I think that for some people, that's how it works. Once they really fully grasp the, the structure of a novel, regardless of what you know genre they're writing in, when you can understand those fundamentals and what is really essential, um, it is easier to freestyle because you intuitively know where things need to be. You've done it enough to where you can freestyle in a way that is acceptable. And then if you understand it again, as far as construction and plotting and structure goes, you can put it back into that timeline, look at it and figure out where the holes are. So that's where I have slowly evolved through all of this. But when I started, I just freestyled and it sucked like balls. It was just terrible. <laughs> so yeah, it was the worst thing ever. Uh, and so I eventually figured out my process, but everybody has to go through that. And I think everybody evolves with their process as time goes on because you, you learn, you intuit where those beats are. And I think as you get better at feeling where those beats are, as you're writing, you can sense that you've missed it. At least I can. There will be certain points where I will write something and I'll say, no, oh, I, I mean, I, I'll use this, but this doesn't go here, you know, and I'll think, no, that doesn't go there. And so then I'm moving things around again. And um, it's really, 
I think the previous guest we had on here, Allie, she talked about magic and it really is. It's this magical puzzle piece that you're putting together. And each time I do it, I think to myself at some point, someone's going to figure out that I'm a hack, that I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> that I'm the worst writer in the world. And then somehow I managed to pull it together and figure it out. And I think to myself, hallelujah, I managed a little bit of magical genius again, hope it lasts. And that's... <laughs> You know, I hope I can do it again for the next book. So, um, but you do get better at it as you go and it always changes. Yes. So. And there's the imposter syndrome, which we'll do a whole episode on at some point yeah. talking about imposter syndrome because it's fun. All right, Virginie, lay it out for us. Why is plotting your favorite thing ever? Finally, <laughs> finally, because all this, <laughs> while I'm listening, CJ, I'm like, this is chaotic. This is chaotic. I'm... <laughs> um, and she's absolutely right. Your style really evolves. And it sounds like uh, my style is evolving more and more towards an extreme degree of OCD. It's getting worse or better. I don't know, depending. Um, I, I think when I just started this uh, self-publishing thing, you know, I was like, mm, I don't, I'm not creative. I don't know what. I, I I don't think I want to, I don't know how to do it. So it was just, oh, here's an idea. Oh, that's an idea. What, what do I do about this? And I think it's just my natural personality. That's what you have to think about what works for you. There's no one way of doing things. I think my natural personality is I need order. I need, <laughs> I need you know, structure structure uh framework so the way how i do things so i i also don't sleep much because i dream a lot of weird stuff and i also have a um, notebook next to my these days it's more like a phone which is really bad i know guys let's not talk about <laughs> the phone. It. so and usually what happens is i i sleep up i i dream about something i wake up in the middle of the night and i skype cj or jenna this is what I dreamed about, like for real, <laughs> for real. If we, yep, go back yep. to the, if we go back to our, um, you know, our conversation, there's a lot of really intricate plot that I've developed while dreaming. It's like, I'm actually, I'm pre- quite impressed, I have to say. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, so what the way how I like to do it is I have those ideas. So I have a, uh, just a, uh, like a, a, constant thread um so i use uh technology way more than cj i think so i have my the i use a mac so in my note section i have book ideas topic ideas so i put all my ideas in one place so and i revisit them uh from time to time and uh and then when i start thinking about okay this could be potentially a story that i really want to get into so i organize really like those are my characters what what do they look like what are their physical traits what are their personalities like so I have those cards for each of the characters and um it's not really hard because often they're based on real people uh and sometimes reality overtakes the the fiction and it's really it's great you don't need to go to see a a a shrink it's great because you can do whatever you want to all those characters so this is like this is my creative my my creativity juice because it's license to do anything license to kill license to destroy oh i'm oh i love it so and then you can tell that it's not a romance book that that's my I never would have made the mistake right. of thinking that you were ever willingly outlining a romance book for G. So, so, and then I use also the mapping. So I have this also, I, uh, wrong circle. Uh, but, um, normally I use a tool on my laptop, like a man mapping uh, tool, software, but I found that the whole idea of having gadgets, you know, like a whiteboard, pen, cut different colors. I like that. I like that motion. And that helps me actually to get creative. So I, I do, I do that on that, in that aspect, I do the same as CJ. I have a big circle and I see how the connection between the different characters, how they can, 
you know, and the plot twist, that's where I can see how I can squeeze in uh, those plot twists that people are not expecting. But generally, I am a plotter, like really organized plotter. I have a like I have my little card for each of the pers- uh each of the characters, and then there's a a chronological order. So I ba- basically I make entire life for that person. And again, it's not really hard because it's often based on the real person. Yeah, so I don't do any of the panther thing. I mean, St- St- Stephen Stephen King can say all he wants because <laughs> of course he knows who I am. Uh, he can say all he wants, but I am a very proud, organized plotter. That's that's Excellent. how do you do it? Ain't Jenna? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing. Yeah, what about yes. Oh, well, one quick note when we're talking about drawing on your real life, just because I saw this come up in a Facebook group recently, uh, there was an author who used the first and last name of their company's CFO and some of his um, personality traits and other such things as the villain in his book, and he was fired. (laughs) So while you can... It's not funny. Um, yes. Yeah. It, it, it is, but it isn't. It, it's just a thing to keep in mind that at a certain point you may want to, you know, it, it's that whole scratch off the serial numbers thing. Because we do base the things that we write very often off of, you know, people that we know, things that we've, people we've met, stuff that's happened. But you do want to be a little bit careful about scratching off the serial numbers because you do start running really, really close to libel. And in his case, you know, a loss of job is a sucky thing to have happen, even if you are getting, you know, you're, you're able to make somebody you don't care for into a villain, but you, you don't want to lose jobs or have other problems because of it. So just keep keep that in mind as we talk about this, that you do want to scratch those serial numbers off. Good point. Anyway, yeah. well, um, for me, I am a mapper, but in a different way. So when I look at a story, I look at it the same way that I look at planning the trip from my house to grandma's house. So my, my in-laws live about four hours away by car. And so I know that we're going to start at my house and that there's a soda shop and that's where we're going to, that, that's our inciting incident is that we have to go to the soda place because my husband needs a very large soda to sit next to him while he's driving. Um, and so that's going to happen. And there is a gas station about halfway there that has the world's largest rocking chair out in front of it. And so we always stop there to get pictures of our kids in this giant rocking chair because it's really funny. And we've got years of pictures of our kids in this giant rocking chair. And so so we know these places and then there's grandma's house. And then we know that because we have a small child and a woman who has been pregnant in the car, there's going to have to be other stops for visiting the restroom. We also know that there is a stretch where you have to go about 36 miles and there is no place to stop there. So, so you know there's a restroom here, there's a restroom here. In between, there is no stopping, except for when the small child absolutely must go and you teach them about peeing outside. So with my mapping with my stories, it's a lot the same way where I'm going to figure out, here's the plot, the points that I have to hit. I need this. I need this inciting incident. I know they have to go here. I know this has to happen here. The climactic point has to be here. And then we get to grandma's house. And then in between that, I do a lot more um, pantsing where it may be that the characters kind of wander along and, hey, we see, again, going back to the road trip, we see a sign for there's a petting zoo. Let's go check out the petting zoo. Why not? But we're going to come back onto the road because the goal is still to get to grandma's house. And by having those goals, it helps me to keep the pantsing from wandering off to parts unknown to where it's really hard to get it back online. Um, or I can change the map. I can decide instead of going to grandma's house, we're going to Vegas. But still, that, though, having those points lets me know, do I need to change the entire map or can I just bring this back after I've let it pants? And a lot of times I pants characters and I plot the plot. So the plot says, here's where we're going. But if the characters, we need a romance subplot, we we want to do a relationship thing between siblings, whatever, a lot of that I pants and I kind of let, you know, the imaginary people in my head talk to me. And then I just transcribe everything that they say. So. I I just want to say this, this kind of 
uh, timeline, it, 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 it applies maybe more to some genre than others. Um, so like romance, from my understanding, because I cannot say anything about it, because I don't know anything about it. But from my understanding, there's all those points, those spots that you need to hit, right? Whereas when I, in my genre, which is more the thriller, Nordic noir, mystery kind of genre, I like, I actually purposely seek to get out of those expectations because but but that that's just me because when i when i'm in the in when i'm on the other side as a reader i hate reading a book that has all those points stopping points so um but yeah um because i, I think bet I, most of the books that you think don't have stopping points have them have stopping it's just, points. yes yeah, it, because it, it's not really a stop it's right. just it, it's just knowing here's where an emotional beat's happening here's where there's yeah. going to be a climax mysteries and thrillers just like anything else they do have a climactic point most of the time whether that's the detective denouement where the te detective comes out and says here's all the people who could do it or it's you know now we're with a thriller we're, we're running up against the bad guy because we have to stop the plague from spreading that they, they still have those points yeah. but it you, you try really hard not to stop the pacing and particularly in thriller that pacing is really important I think maybe it's also about the expectations for because for a romance right. book, you know, there's a certain expectations that you have to meet. Mm -hmm. Whereas for all the genres, maybe it's not as strong. I mean, there there are expectations, but it's not as defined as in a romance book. So uh yeah, anyway, so that was just well, and I also think what you're talking about too, Virginie, is about tropes as well, something that's unexpected. And yeah. that's when you want to try to, I mean, you want to give the readers what they expect and what they love, but you also want to turn that trope on its head if you can a little yeah. bit. So that, so it's, it's not necessarily a plot point, but it is a plot device yeah. um, that allows you to turn events on their head, but still give them what they want and crave, whether it be romance, whether it be thriller or suspense. So I agree with that in the sense that you want to take that very formulaic approach and still use what they love, but do it in a way that they've never seen it done before, if you can. Mm -hmm. um, I guess so the they're not expecting it, you know, it's not as predictable as it normally would be. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as a, you know, as a, a, a reader of that genre myself, I know that if it ends as expected, it annoys the shit out of me. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, well, and see, this is why romance is a terrible idea for you because the expectation always is a very, very specific type of ending, but in other niche markets and other genres like thriller, horror, I mean, there's some leeway there in the way that they, they end things. Although with horror, it's always ending very eerily, right? It's like, you've, you've solved it, but then have you really solved it? Mm -hmm. And you know, that not knowing and that wondering, um, it's, it's killer for a lot of people who want a specific type of ending. And yeah. then it's amazing for anyone else who's like, Ooh, and now what could happen? What are the, you know, then they go to bed thinking about it going, Oh my gosh. And what about this? And what about that? And, and they love it. I think um, it just confirms so. my, uh, need for pain. And, you know, <laughs> uh, because on one hand I'm like, Oh, come on. This cannot be the ending. This cannot be the ending. But on the other hand, I'm like, if I did get the ending that I thought it would be, I'd be like, oh, come on. This is so <laughs> predictable. How, how, what a lack of creativity, you know? So this, it, it's, it, it's, yeah, I am a masochist. I, <laughs> Okay. I mean, no judging, but I do, but it does speak to reader expectations, right? Because even though we, we study the market and we study what our readers are expecting within the market, I think some people fail to understand how important that is. But if you will just look at yourself and the things that you like and the way in which you might be disappointed if a writer doesn't actually deliver what you like, then, then it starts to hit home to you because I'm telling you right now, when I watch a movie 
that's supposed to be a romance. And I am surprised by a death at the end. I am outraged. I am upset. I am like, no, it was not. No, I feel wronged on so many levels, you know, because I went into it thinking it was something else. And it was really just this bait and switch. You don't want to do that to your readers. You don't want to give them something that they don't like and that they don't want. Because if they had, if they had come to, you know, if they were looking for a tragic romance, well, a tragic love story, they would have, you know, gone the Nicholas Sparks route or deeper or darker, you know, Mm -hmm. they would not have come to me and my fluffy romantic comedies. And so you always want to make sure that you're not mismatching those, those expectations. So just think on the way in which you would be disappointed if those expectations were not meant for you particularly, and then please recognize that that's how everyone is. Everyone has certain expectations. And when they're disappointed that that author didn't meet those, um, either it's the author's boo-boo because they failed to understand their readership's expectations, or it's the reader's boo-boo because they read in a genre that they don't normally read. Um, and so, you know, they didn't recognize that, oh, that's not that's not actually what happens in this sub-niche. Go to the next door sub-niche and check that one out. That's where you're going to find what you like. Um, so so if I want to, if I'm really uh, having a episode of insomnia, what I do is I put on a rom com movie, <laughs> guaranteed. Five minutes in, I'm asleep. Oh, he's and so, see, so harsh. So that's harsh. That's an expectation, right? You know that if you want to sleep at night, romantic comedies all the way. <laughs> Perfect. And they deliver exactly what you want them to. And that's important. Yeah. Perfect. That's again, expectations. It's all about knowing what your target audience is. And when you're a reader, it's about knowing if you're the target audience. Like right. you say, some sometimes you read outside of your normal genres and you are pleasantly surprised at how good it is. And sometimes you figure out, yep, this is a total mismatch for me. This is not where I want to be reading. And that's sure. okay. And as authors, we want to engage with, you know, the the biggest appropriate target market that we can because we you you can write a book that there's only 30 people in the world who are ever going to love it, but that's generally not the books that you're writing as part of growing your career. Those are often very niche passion projects, and you should totally do those because it's really fun. But when we look at this as a career where we're saying we want a financial turnaround, you do have to kind of look at the things you love and the things you're plotting and the ideas you have and go, how do I put this to a target audience and meet their expectations so that I'm going to make the kind of sales that I want as, as well as just getting the book out there? And that's that whole, um, I think one of the things, the terms that I like for what we're talking about here is surprising yet inevitable, that you get to a place and you're surprised by it. And then you think about it and you go, no, it had to happen that way, that the inevitability was there, but you were surprised by it in the moment. And and readers across lots of different genres really do love that where where they go oh yes the dark lord has to be defeated but the way that it happens and the moment that it comes together in a in a fantasy is often surprising even though it was inevitable that eventually this clash has to happen because that's the trope so we'll, we'll talk more about tropes and stuff in another another podcast because that's not this one um let's go back a little bit so now we've talked about you know different ways that we can plot or pants or whatever but i think there are some really really great tools out there for saying, you know, how how do I kind of define this? And so, like, we talked about Save the Cat with Ali. Um, and I think we, we've talked before about Gwen Hayes romancing the beat because she gives very, very specific beats. And I think we've talked about that before. So what are some other methods out there? What, what other um, tools and resources can we direct people at if they're trying to figure out how can I plot more? How can I pants more? You know, what, what other resources can we give them to kind of talk about things you might want to look into? Well, I think the first way to begin, um, if I'm ever looking for a new method for, for plotting, outlining, or, or a way to pants, I do a Google search that is genre specific. And I'll just say something along the lines of um, uh, urban fantasy plot or urban fantasy plot and structure, Uh, you know, something that will offer me a template because I guarantee you some beautiful, wonderful, overachieving author or teacher before you 
put some resources up there to help you. And of course, there are others that we will talk about. But just if you're stumped, that's a good place to start is to actually do a Google search because you will find a plethora of resources just by doing that. And you could even use that keyword phrase within an Amazon search box and look at all the books that pop up for writing specifically. You know, I, one, one book that I bought was called How to Write a Damn Good Mystery. And I love that book so much. Well, that's and awesome. It's such a good book. And so you can find resources like that. Um, and then there are also authors turned teachers who have websites that are devoted to teaching authors um, how to plot and structure their books or how to navigate the world of planting, pantsing specific to uh, the, the niche market that they're in. So uh, Derek Murphy comes to mind. He's a great indie author. Is it Creative Indie? I'm trying to remember. I think it's creativeindie.com. But he uh, has I'll, a- I'll look. Yeah, he's got a 24 chapter outline <laughs> template that is phenomenal. And it, for some, it would feel very constricting. Um, I've used it a little bit and I enjoy it. Um, and uh, he also has just a one page um, dot or plot point for that specific 24 chapter outline where he really goes over all of the different beats. He labels them kind of uh, the hints as to what to expect within each chapter. And this is his way or breakdown, just studying novels, writing novels. What he's found is, you know, happens most commonly within the, the sub niches that he works in. Um, and then as far as software goes, I've mentioned Plotter before, but I've really delved a lot deeper into it now, simply because I, I, I hit a wall, as I told Jana a while back, and I was very stuck with my book um, because I was having too many starts and stops and not being consistent enough as I was writing. So I was just getting lost. I was lost in the sauce. And so it, it, you know, it was this idea of, well, let's go back to the beginning and let's just put what you have written into a plotting timeline within plotter and i actually used uh gwen hayes romance in the beat plot structure for this particular book in order to plug in what i identified as okay that's where this beat is happening okay in this chapter i can see that that's happening over there when it should be happening over here um and so it was very helpful so i think plotter because it it gives you a visual timeline of things because it allows you to create chapter bios it allows you to create all sorts of um, you know, world building, all of these notes and things that you can use within your series. Um, and not only that, but it also allows you to take all of these very well-known different types of outlines and, and they plug them into Plotter and you can quite literally choose whichever outline you want to work with. It'll pop up on there and then you can begin to either plot what you want to plot or you can take what you already have and put it in there and see if it fits accordingly based on what you have. So those are those are some resources that I have worked with that I have found to be helpful. But I know that um, Virginie and Jana have worked with other things. So what are your suggestions, you guys? You know how much I love a good software slash gadget slash something that's really detailed and structured. So um, Derek's 24 chapters is like my heaven. It's like, oh my God, I love it. I love it. Um, and then Plotter. I start playing a little bit more with it. Uh, I, 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 I think it's a great tool. Do we want to talk about AI? Oh, as in like how you could use it for just a, a basic idea for outlining? Yeah. Oh, let's brush um, the surface. We'll get deeper into AI in another episode where we can devote the entire episode to it. But yeah. let, let's go ahead and touch on it. What what can you do with AI? Um, right now, as of the time of this recording, there are several um, AI writing softwares that are pretty big. PseudoWrite, uh, ChatGPT is the one that is currently shaking the author world for good or for ill. <laughs> um, there's playground, um, there's several others, but go ahead, CJ, how have you been using AI to help with outlining? Oh, you know, for me, it's all about brainstorming. I find that it's easier for me to come up with ideas when I can riff off of other ideas. So I may find some, um, writing prompt online. Uh, let's say I want to do a vampire romance book. So I was just testing things out and playing with it and having a good time. Um, and I found a fun little uh, vampire prompt that I thought, that's cool. And so I just went to the AI and I said, using Gwen Hayes romancing the beat structure, 
um, create an outline with, and then I plugged in that premise and then I just let the AI go. And it, you know, it, it came up with a fairly decent plot structure approach to what I could possibly do. And it was enough, I think, to get anybody going. I, I mean, I think for some writers, a premise is enough. Uh, but for other folks, if they're looking at it going, how would I structure this? Where would I put things? Um, the AI generated some pretty solid ideas as far as what could happen, where you could put stuff. It would get a little confused as far as like, structure goes you know like as you said you found this happening jana where conflicts were happening one right after the other in an order that didn't make sense as far as you know plot and structure goes but they were ideas that i thought were interesting that i could then massage back into that that outline um so i have found that the ai is a fun little friend when it comes to brainstorming ideas um, and I have kind of enjoyed that process. Uh, please don't mistake this for writing your novel. You do not want an AI to write your novel. That that comes with its own host of issues. So don't do that. But as far as just brainstorming stuff and seeing if maybe you could come up with a solid structure to work from, it wasn't a bad idea. And I'm going to keep playing with it because I think it's fun. When you can yeah. get on because it gets... It, it's been very busy because it's very popular. Yeah. But so, that is something AI is good at is logical flow. Yeah. And so sometimes when you do have all of these ideas to to ask a computer to help you find the logical flow, um, that that can be really really helpful as a tool in your quiver. Go ahead, V. No, I just want to say, uh, I, you know, uh, I thought because it's so it's such a hot topic at the moment, so mm -hmm. that it's good for us to just mention it. But right now, uh, definitely, don't use it to write your book. This it's just no. <laughs> It's just no, no. 100 percent no. Uh, but like CJ said, it's I think it's great to get some more ideas. Um, and you know, you know, new ideas or bring more new ideas, and it's uh, it's never a bad thing to have a lot of ideas and to and then to structure those ideas. You know how I like structure, structure, <laughs> yes. structure ideas and <laughs> use the more conventional. You know the you know uh, the um, uh, Derek's 24 chapters and plotters and more conventional tools. But I think, Jenna, you also use some other things. Um, I, I think otherwise, the other kinds of things that I applied to it, um, we, we talked about last week, Save the Cat and Save the Cat Writes a Novel, which is a really great book for, there's 15 beats in there. And so you can structure along with those beats, which is really kind of nice. Um, and there's the story code, Amy White does the story code and you can Google her and she's kind of amazing. And that's kind of, that's applying the story mountain in a different way. And they've got some software that's kind of helpful with that. But I think we've hit some of the biggest ones. Um, but this does lead me while we're talking about resources and tools into another type of resources and tools that I wanted to bring up. And that is, I find that no matter which genre I'm writing in, as I'm creating outlines, as I'm even pantsing or this, set and the other, there are always details that I either need to go and research or that I have researched and I need to keep them on the tip of my fingers or on the tip of my head. And sometimes organizing that pile of stuff becomes a little bit much. And it's easy to say things like, well, if it's contemporary romance, then you don't have to world build or anything because it, it's just our world, except you totally do especially if you're writing this contemporary romance and putting it someplace where you don't live. So like here in Utah, we're, we're landlocked, folks. We, we have a gigantic salty lake that you don't treat like an ocean because it'd be bad. Um, so, so to say I'm going to write a nice little beach romance, that's very different than Utah is. And I've had to ask people because I, I did this a long time ago. I, I will admit to my shame here. I wrote a short story on an Oregon beach without realizing how freaking cold it is on most Oregon beaches. And I wrote it the way one would write a California beach until somebody in Oregon let me know that I was wrong. So many levels of wrong because the beaches do not function the same way when you're that far north, y'all. Um, and, and going surfing in those beaches is a good way to get hypothermia, apparently. No. So, um, Again, I was very young when I wrote this story, but it's a really good example of even here just within the U.S., things are different. The types of foods that you might eat, the types of um, e even idiomatic things, the, the way people speak. 
it's different and it can be that way even within one state. So yes, you do have those details that you need to keep track of, even if you're writing contemporary, much less when you get into science fiction and fantasy where you're talking about magic systems and all that kind of thing. In mystery, keeping track of, here's all the clues. Here's the clues that are red herrings. Here's where the bad guys are. So there's a lot of information to keep track of and there are some good ways to do that. So Virginie, since you love a good organizational rant, how do you keep track of all the details that go into your novel so that you're sure now that you've kind of plotted it out that you're going to have all of those when you're doing the writing and so okay. you don't, you know, have Fred who turns into Bob halfway through the book? So uh, Google Drive, it's my friend. Google, it's my friend. Google Drive, it's my other friend. I love Google Drive. Before I start anything, I create a folder. You know, I don't know mystery book death of because it has to come with death or something death of oliver i don't know and this is the my folder this is the general folder and then in the general folder there's going to be a lot of subfolders there's going to be a sort of subfolder for research there's going to be a subfolder for all my bios for each of the characters so i'm going to create a lot of subfolders in there uh and just one document. And it's really, really difficult to have a million of different documents. So for example, all my bio, all the bios is on one document, just but on you know different page, but within one word document. Otherwise, I'm going to end up with six million different documents, and it's gonna take me three million hours to even just go through, read through all each of the documents. So one theme so all the bios or, or one document all the research uh, you know maybe there's you know if i'm if i'm right if the, my story is taking place in a city that i'm not particularly familiar i want to make sure that i'm doing the research about that city so um you know uh because because i grew up in paris so i'm relatively familiar with that place but there's a lot of things that i don't know about so i want to make sure that all my research it's on that page, so so I'm so I'm I'm going to Google and do those research. There's a tool that I use, and that's a free tool that I love. Is when you do your research, you know, you open a tab, and then it's just a rabbit hole you're going down, and suddenly you end up you you end up with seventy two tabs all open, and your computer is not moving. Yes. Uh, it's all of us. Um, your computer is not moving. At the end of the day, you're like, oh, I'm not going to close my computer because I have all those tabs open and I need to look at those things. So, and then your computer is really struggling because it's, you know, because you have the 72 tabs open in this, in Chrome browser, and maybe you have another 40 in Safari browser, and then you have, you know, your Word document open, your other software, it, it, your computer can- I, I feel attacked now. <laughs> yeah, I, it's intentional. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting just, here going, me, me. I'm, I, I, me. I'm looking at my other windows going, one, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six. Oh crap! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just uh, intentionally shaming uh, both of you. So I, I, <laughs> I've decided that I'm Appreciate including it. CJ in that as well. Um, there's a free Chrome extension that's called One Tab. It's just in one word. O, uh, so O N E and then T A B, and what it does, so you install that Chrome extension and it's going to be, you know, you're going to pin into your browser bar. And what it does, it's in one, that's what I do. At the end of the day, I click on that uh, button, the one tab uh, Chrome extension, and then it will save all my tabs into one page. Mm -hmm. And then I can name it, I can do, research on Paris underground world. And then everything, all the tabs that they open will be saved on one page. And then I can close my computer, shut it down. And the next day or whenever I need it, I can just click on that one tab extension button again, and you will show all the pages that I checked. And, and you, can, you can restore all the pages, you can close some, you can or reopen some. It's just a really clean way to keep all your research 
um, URLs on one page. So I love using that tool. I use it constantly. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's what, that's what I do. So Google Drive, one folder and then subfolder and keep things in within the same theme on one in one document and then use one tab uh, to keep things organized. Are you oh, like all blown too. away? Are you just like, oh my God, this we, we are very I just blown added away. the extension while oh, you were good. talking. I, yeah, I see, like we it. learn things. We learn things when we do this podcast. So CJ, yeah. what do you generally do? Um, nothing until plotter. So life has been rough. The 40 years that I've lived have not been great for me when it comes to organization and finding everything, just letting you know. Uh, I finally just decided, because I do the same thing, I've got all of these tabs open and then I'm like trying to bookmark things and go through the list of bookmarks, craziness. Uh, so I finally got smart once, well, I got smart because I met Jana and Virginie. Before that, I was working harder and not smarter. So uh, I got organized when it came to just, you know, files as far as organizing everything that I have published so that I'm not hunting for things. I do that in Google Drive. Uh, but then within Plotter, there's so many templates for character bios and so many templates for, um, you can create your own templates, by the way, within Plotter for glossaries or world building. Um, and so for me, because I need questions to prompt me when it comes to answers to think about things. I just went to um, Google and I did a search for a world building template that had like a mass of questions I could ask myself. And then I could think it all up and I could put it in a uh, plotter and play with it. So those are the things I do. Nice. Um, I do have a lot of tabs open, but I do get more organized than that. I like using OneNote. Um, it, it comes with the Microsoft suite, so it, it's easy to play hands on. And that's nice because I can both put you, you can do OneNote online. And when I'm working, so I've got some of my books I collaborate. And if I'm working with another writer, then having everything in the OneNote means that we can share that OneNote. And so we'll have a page that is here's characters, here's plot points, and you can drop pictures in there. So I can grab things and say, such and such an actor is kind of how I'm envisioning this person and grab that and drop it there into OneNote. Um, I can keep track of a lot of that kind of stuff there. So I use that. Um, I know one of our friends uses ClickUp, which I've looked at before and so my problem with, th that's an honest to goodness project management software. And I know some people also use Scrivener um, as both writing software and as a place to keep everything, which is all phenomenally cool. Uh, my problem with it is if there's too many bright, shiny things for me to play with, I will play with keeping all my research and organizing it all and color coding it and all that kind of thing instead of writing. So while we want to give you some tool suggestions that you can work with, also make sure that these do not become something that you do instead of writing because it's fun to procrastinate and to create, here is the character sheet with the pictures and everything for every single person, but eventually you got to put the words down. Um, and then I know people who create a physical story Bible, kind of like scrapbooking except for your books. Um, and again, fun, but again, that for me, that's way too much of a distraction because it, it would be, oh, I have to go and cut out this thing and glue it together. And, and I'm not real great at, I'm great at crafts, but not that one. The scrapbooking thing was never my jam. I make really ugly scrapbook pages. And so the physical story Bible doesn't work for me, but I do know people who swear by that too. So there's lots of different ways. I think the biggest thing we can emphasize though for our listeners is have some way to organize it because otherwise you're chasing things. And a lot of the time where you're going to run into a real problem is when your editor is coming through later and going, wait, th this has got a problem because these facts don't work, or this is scientifically impossible. Or for, for one of my clients, I, I had such a good time. I ended up making a spreadsheet that was all of the names that he had used in a book and which letter they started with. And he had used so many names that started with a J that I took his J key away and told him he was not allowed to name any more characters <laughs> that started with the same letter because we, we were getting to the point, it was all three of the main characters and a bunch of side characters. It's like, nope, nope, my, my brain can't do it anymore. I am restricting your J key. You may 
for the rest of your series, you cannot name anybody else. So he did go back through and, and change some of them. But there was a nice little spreadsheet that said, here's every name that you've used and the starting sounds, because that is something that throws readers, is if you have a whole bunch of characters and it's all the same starting sound, then they start to get confused as to, is this one David or Daniel or Derek or Dabula, which, which one is it? So sometimes even just a whole bunch of spreadsheets that then go into a folder tree or something like that can be a really effective way just to keep things organized, but to get to the point that you can keep moving forward, which is entirely the point. All right, so that said, we've been talking for a while. I hope it's been stuff that's been interesting and is really helpful. Um, next week, we're going to start talking about romance because it's gonna be February. You, you may have to give, you know, Virginia CPR after all of this because she's <laughs> we, we know but we're going to talk about love stories too we're going to talk about some great things but before we go today let us move on to the most entertaining part of the podcast at least in my opinion and CJ what is something completely and utterly irrelevant that is going on in your world today so two nights ago I thought someone had broken in um, oh, no. while I was sleeping. So I'm, I'm in bed with my daughter. My kids had left to go stay with their dad. Um, and all of a sudden, because we have three little dogs that bark at everything, the dogs are barking and I'm like, what is going on? And that usually means someone's here. So I walk out there and Chloe comes out behind me. Um, and I notice that the front door is wide open. And I was like, we were almost asleep and the front door is wide open. Why is the front door wide open? And I remembered locking the front door, closing the front door, locking the front door. And yet there it is wide open. So I walk over and I go, huh, this is alarming. So I close it. I lock it. Chloe's next to me. And I was like, we're just going to check all of the rooms. And she's like, well, if someone is here, shouldn't you call 911? And I was like, this child is smarter than me. Uh, so <laughs> I, I didn't think that there was an intruder in the house. I was pretty sure what happened after I, you know, as I was thinking it through, I was fairly certain that maybe I had just shut and locked the door, assuming that all of the children who were going with their dad had left already. Um, but it also didn't really. It, so I think what happened was the last child was still in the house, opened the door, left and thought they'd closed it. But I also wasn't sure. And so I'm checking all of the rooms with I think I had grabbed what the hell did what did I grab? I don't know. It was something that was sharp. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's all such a blur now. Um, but I had grabbed it and we started going room to room and looking in the closets. And the whole time, Chloe's like, I really think you should call 911. I'm like, I'm sure it's fine. Cause there was only slight, a little bit of doubt, you know, but mostly I was pretty sure a kid had left the door open. But still, there I was with a sharp object. Um, we were fine, just letting you know. Uh, but it was a little scary there for a second. And, um, again, I, I, cause in my mind, I'm like, whatever, I'm going to get the jerk who broke into my house and my child <laughs> call nine one one. What is wrong with you? <laughs> so, oh. This is at least the second story about some things suspiciously. Yeah. Cause something outside was, it was a grasshopper jumping oh, yes. on my window. I feel that I'm a bit of an alarmist and this is why I do not watch horror movies ever by myself with people. It doesn't matter. I just don't watch them. My brain cannot handle the right. stimulation. So nice. this does not happen. Not at all. All right, V, have you got a story to top that one? Oh, uh, I think I do. I think I really do because so I'm still in Japan and I'm just I think it's it's such a fascinating country. You know, I've never been somewhere where there's so many contradictions and paradoxes and it just the paradoxes or paradoxi. What's the plural of paradox? Paradoxes. I'm not in on that. Paradoxes? I have no idea. Paradoxes. Okay, paradoxes. So um I I I, I'm uh, deep in this whole maid cafe culture. Uh, so it's basically like a normal cafe, but you go in there and the waitress are dressed as maids. And so they have like this French maid costumes and they serve things like Hi Hello Kitty, cutie thing on pancakes. So, so everything is made like in teddy bear and things like that and i'm just like okay this is very strange but um 
okay, why not? But then I discovered something else and I thought, no, no, it's a thing. There's made cafes where you go in as a customer to be slapped. Oh. At. Yeah. Well, that That's a what? thing. <laughs> what? Yeah. That, that was, I think it helps your story, CJ. So, so basically, the customers, they go in there for the, yeah, I think I, I, I'm assuming they also drink coffee and eat something, but also they go there, they sit there, and the wait, waitress come in front of you and just. And just you. smacks you in the face a few times and then says, here's your coffee. Yeah. Like, you like uh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yep. Wow. So. Oh, so what things I don't get. Right. Okay. So what's the logic behind it? Because I'm sure that you researched this to figure it out. Didn't you? I'm trying to understand, but I, I come to re realize, I think my logic and reason don't necessarily apply here. Mm -hmm. So whatever is logical to me might not be logical to them. Logical to them. So Maybe I, I, it's like an alarm clock, right? You smack someone, it helps them wake up, and then you reinforce it with coffee. But I think that's the thing, because we think there's a reason behind what they do. <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying is that there's not a reason for this I, at all. <laughs> I, I come to think, and this, this, you know, this brings peace, really. Because if you stop looking for a reason and just accept that's, Sometimes things just happen for absolutely no reason. <laughs> right. I, I think this is a, there's a, a lot of wisdom in 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 this. So then, that was my my, my moment. See, uh, Jenna, top that one up. I I really can't because my my irrelevant moment today is that I am dealing with my house flooding. Um, oh, yeah. Utah is a desert. We're we're called desert, so we do get snow. Um, and we've been in drought for forever. And so there's a whole lot of praying for rain and all this that, and the other. And we've had a really, really great start to the water year, which we are all very happy about. However, it started raining the other day and it started melting the snow. And so it's melting off the roof and it is filling up one of the window wells into our basement and pouring into the house. Mm -hmm. So I found where the leak was and, and I fixed the problem there. There was a rain gutter that was pouring into the garden instead of there, there's an elbow joint that's supposed to carry that water off into the grass and the elbow joint had fallen off. Um, so probably the weight of the snow during the, the when we had the big snow. So I got that all fixed. It, it's now taking off. But one of our basement rooms, the carpets are soaked. Everything is soaked. And we don't want to move the furniture, but we've got to get under the carpet in order to get things dry. So I'm getting really creative with different ways to bring up enough of the carpet that I can shove a blower under there and get everything dry without having to pull up all of the carpet and move all of my child's stuff out of the room so that it can. So it, it's a thing, y'all. And, oh. and one day it will go into a book. That's, that's what I always say about these kinds of things is I keep track of them because in the moment it's so frustrating, but there's all these little details and all these things that I've now learned. Um, I, I, I built my own shop vac. When, when you get a shop vac, there's the motor piece and then there's the big drum that it comes in and everything else is in pieces in there. So I had to build the legs for it and I had to get all the hoses connected and I, I spent a, a whole morning screwing all the things together. And I'm, I've learned things that I can use in, in a story at some point about how you put a shop back together because it, it was very fascinating. And put, that in the, put, put that in the research folder. You know. Yep, it goes in the research folder of things but I have also, learned to do that will be useful. Also, just how rude. You paid for it and it didn't come pre-made? Like, nope, I'm nope, offended. No. It, yeah. it doesn't come pre-made. It, it comes with a whole bunch of parts and a lot of screws. And it doesn't even come with a, screw, a screwdriver. So I had to go find my own Phillips screwdriver. But I, I collect tools. I like tools. Um, mm -hmm. So that that was easy. But yeah, it, it's oh, been I'm an experience. To, I'm just going to squeeze in another sequence that's not planned. And I think we're going to make recommendations. So my recommendation today, <laughs> I, 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 you know. We're already way be, be beyond the normal time frame, so we're, and we're chatty today. Yeah, right, so right. My recommendation is a movie, and it's uh, called Spirited Away. The, so this is a movie that I watched about thirteen times, which is really surprising because it's a uh, it's a Japanese anime. Uh, yeah, it's Miyazaki. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's, Miyazaki. it's beautiful. 
I highly recommend. It's not just for kids, not at all. Actually, it's a little bit scary for the really little ones, I think. Uh, but it's beautiful. So I highly recommend. So Spirit is Away. That was my recommendation. So this is this is how we start a new trend. <laughs> oh, so we're going to make recommendations from now on. Where There's was that? A recommendation. Did you get this from the shop vac? Because it felt like you were going to tie it back to the shop vac, that somehow the shop vac had inspired. Oh, yes, because the mate... Okay. The mate, they are dressed as a, uh, the mate, no, the, those waitress who are dressed as uh, mates, they're, they're, it's based on uh, anime's characters. Mm -hmm. yeah. But still no shop back. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. All right, guys. <laughs> thank you so much for coming uh, today. Thanks for joining us. We'll get on top of this. You can find the show and the show notes at www.alantumdigital.com and follow the podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast distributor. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye now. Bye.